Bonjour à tous. Hello, everybody. An exceptional new documentary from Modus TV, and this is a present from us to you at the end of the year. Remember a couple of months ago, a special onboard camera program with Patrick Tambay as the consultant? Well, it was a huge success, and a lot of you have let us know that you enjoyed the program. So we've decided to follow it up with this, a second edition, and since it's not a good idea to change a winning team, we're pleased to welcome back Patrick Tambay back with us to go through 16 new sequences. I wanted to ask you a short question in place of the introduction. It's true that when we watch this kind of program, we get the impression that it was fabulous at the time on these circuits in the 80s, let's say. Great circuits, great drivers, enormous courage. In short, we get the impression that it was better than it is now. Is that true? There were great circuits with a lot of courage that was necessary for the pilots, with pilots who had a lot of courage. We had the impression that it was better before than now. Is that true? Is that true? Well, I'm particularly nostalgic, he says, about the time. It's true that it gives me enormous pleasure to see these pictures again. They are witness to my career, to a particular era, and an occasion for me to see the drivers that were against me at the time on some mythical circuits. Makes us realize that we were very avant-garde, ahead of our time, if you like. Enormous progress has been made on the circuit since then, and the onboard camera technology has made considerable progress as well. But as far as courage is concerned, we were no braver than today, even if the circuits are not as safe, even if the cars were not as safe than they are today. We were just as rash, just as flamboyant. Basically, drivers, they were the same then as they are today. Okay, Patrick, uh, let's get straight to the heart of the matter. We'll use the same equipment. I'll click on the mouse and we're off for the first sequence. And this is a surprise and it concerns you. Well, the first thing I can see is the narrowness of the circuits. I recognize Imola straight away on board the Renault. And in principle, that helmet is Prost or not Prost. He's in a McLaren in front. Well, note that little bit of white sticky tape on the tires. That's one of the problems on the circuit at Imola. At the time, they hadn't yet modified the track. Uh, we really had to work on the brakes, on the speeding of the brakes as well, the spreading of them as well. It's not the easiest of places to drive. It was a circuit where the main difficulties were fuel consumption and brakes, as we've mentioned. And we came into the Tosa at great speed, and you needed very good brakes. I'm in a warm-up lap, a running lap for the brake pads and discs. And this is Aqua Minerale, where the second part has been completely transformed. Not in the second part, but in the first part with the deceleration chicane. At the time, the circuit was essentially a high-speed circuit, very fast, lots of braking, and the very NT was just about the same. No doubt the edges were higher than they are now. That morning, there was a bit of fog, which is rare. You can see it on the onboard camera, and so the track was relatively slippery. And we went past Alan Prost earlier, and I think we're coming up to Nicky Lauda. McLaren's did really well that season. Good performance due mainly to the quality of their engines and electronics as well in a period when the rules were limited. And here you see a turbo engine giving up the ghost in the first warm-up lap, pity for the driver. I can't see who it is in the fog, but uh, the 1984 season was a great season for Lauda and Prost, who took the World Championship.
Well, the first sequence was for you, anyway, and since it was strong stuff with Imola in the rain and then the engine exploding, it really gives us an idea. Let's uh, put ourselves in your seat and say, I can't see anything. There must be some frightening moments with fog. Well, you get used to that kind of thing, you're prepared for it. In this particular case, the engine was cold and perhaps the overdrive pressure was badly adjusted, so the turbo just went. Okay, second sequence. Uh, we didn't have this circuit in our first program, so let's see it now. We have Jean-Pierre Jabouillet and Buenos Aires. An immensely fast circuit with this combination after the pits, right and left. And here too, the circuit has been transformed a lot. We no longer go towards the end of the circuit with those huge right-hand bends. You also have to put the circuit into its context. Those who've been there will remember there was a stretch by a rubbish dump at one point and then each time we went through very fast right hand bend the smell was really terrible so a long corner a long curve to the right which now rejoins the new track the corner a bit like the oster curve at hockenheim the only car had to be perfectly adjusted for the big bend and the car had to perform well at top speed with a lot of power and uh, gear use. It was a case uh, for Renault and uh, Buenos Aires, a track that's uh, much slower these days. Jean-Pierre Jabouet is having a few problems going in and uh, you can see the problems with the new turbo engines. It was their technical debut, if you like. They took time to respond and uh, get things right. The drivers of that kind of technology were right on the edge and were often quite handicapped by it. Well, you had to anticipate re-acceleration and be very efficient in anticipation, really, right the way through this track, particularly in the corners. Well, Buenos Aires circuit makes us remember Jacques Villeneuve, who had triumphed shortly before. He's no longer part of the Formula One World Championship, of course. After the new circuit now, Patrick, off we go to South Africa. We're in 1983 and a host, Alain Prost. Nouveau circuit maintenant, Patrick. Alors direction, je vous le dis, l'Afrique du Sud. Nous sommes en 1983 et notre hôte est Alain Prost. Yes, with Alain here, certainly uh, Kyle Army, with his immense straight on the South African circuit. You really have to hold the left. You can see it's marked by this exit from the pits during a long distance right up to the end of the straight, where you have to break really hard. Afterwards, there's a combination of very fast corners. And it's true that the circuits had a tendency to have many more of this kind of big corner than they do now. This immense left that came next, particularly delicate to take. We're coming into a slower section which is just behind the pits below and it too consists of a long right hand bend followed by a medium left and you can see that the adherence is excellent here. This is essentially a circuit for engine performance. Here's a right that climbs with a compression and another climb towards a hairpin to the right, the slowest on the circuit. In 1984, I ran out of petrol just after this, a few laps before the finish. Then comes the long Kailami straight, and this really is a circuit that essentially needs high speed and power with good braking stability yeah, for this right turn and the combination of big fast corners as well. We're off on the second lap uh, concerning the altitude. We know that it's a pretty high altitude. Does that make a lot of difference? Well, loss of power for atmospheric engines. The turbo engines were a bit less handicapped than their direct competitors, especially in this combination of long corners, which uh, needed a perfectly balanced uh, approach and a very efficient chassis. 
Well, we're still in the trajectory, so we can hear Alan Prost changing down and using his turbo engine in a big way because the ratios were long for this circuit. The corner left, he's uh, going into a second, and it was difficult when handling the gearbox, especially in the Renault. To be efficient when changing down was difficult. It was a car that was hard to drive on this particular technical domain. And we can hear the turbo engine really working hard. For the next sequence, uh, which is really good, a quick question. Were you always interested in the history of Formula One? When you started, did you know about Fangio and his achievements? Uh, did you know about Jim Clark and the others, let's say? In a rather superficial way, yes. Fangio, Jim Clark and his accident at Hockenheim, they had marked everyone's memory. I think uh, that was the case, but I wasn't really passionate about the history of it. What I really loved was the technical side of driving. The rest came afterwards out of interest for my sport, but not to begin with. Nowadays, I meet some drivers, youngsters, who are starting off and who have no real culture about the history of their sport, although they are passionate about driving and the technical side, just as I was when I was younger. Well, do you consider that this is uh, normal or something of a pity? I think it just entirely depends on the circumstances, on people's individual background and their personalities. In any case, uh, we're going to see a bit of one of the great champions of the past, Jackie Stewart. And I'm going to ask you not to say anything because Jackie Stewart is commentating this lap of Brands Hatch himself. Off camber, left hander, bit of wide. Put the power down in fourth gear. Break hard into third, up into second, down into second, in for Druid. Hugging the kipper all the way round, the flag, the power. Back in, straight into fourth gear from second. It's got us downhill. Applying the power. Going along the bottom behind the pitch. Down into third gear. Long left hander. Tight, tightening corner. Car under steers a bit. Flag the power. Side of the car breaking hard. Fourth gear now for what used to be hot arms. Accelerating along at fourth gear, travel into third gear. Into third gear for this corner. Accelerating again. Out into fourth gear down Deer's Leap. Into third gear again for a tight right hander corner over the curb slightly. Accelerating hard down into second gear. Lock into third gear, into fourth gear, going towards the bridge, breaking hard, into third gear. Well, it makes you realise what hard work it is, both from a breathing and a cardiovascular point of view. You can feel the tension mounting, the rhythm of Jackie's voice accelerating. It's one thing to do it at a standstill and quite another in the car. Note to the circuit at Brands Hatch, very difficult British circuit, which with Silverstone is at the heart of the whole history of British car racing. There's a lot of danger at Brands Hatch with a few metres of grass on one side and then the rail. It can be very tricky. A sequence that is even more remarkable since it dates from 1978, officially five years after Jackie Stewart's retirement. So he climbed back into a Formula One car for the occasion, and it's a priceless document. The next sequence, a much criticized circuit, as we all remember. This is Mexico with Philip Strafe welcoming us aboard. A circuit that received the wrath of all concerned since it was bumpy and dangerous. Et tout et tout. 
Yes, a great historic circuit with a surface, and uh, that is not quite obvious, that is not smooth and uh, gave you enormous problems with grip. Look how the circuit is so dirty. In fact, right from the very first laps, you can see that there are problems with the grip. High altitude circuit two with long portions at high speed, and the turbo engines at the time had an advantage on this kind of track. But you can see that the surface is worn, old and dirty, and this made it difficult to drive Formula One cars here. See the problems that Philip Strafe is having to master his car and uh, an extreme conditions really for everyone taking part here. Very difficult along the longer stretches, big circuit, famous parabolic as well, long corner to the right before the pits is slightly curved and banked, very tough technically. Parabolique, oui. le, le long virage à droite avant les, les stands, légèrement euh, incurvé avec un, un banking. Là, c'est toute la portion euh, la plus éloignée avec cet enchaînement de, de courbes qui ressemble un peu à la plus distante portion. This combination of curves that are a bit like those in Hungary. It was difficult to get into the right gear. At the start, still on this long right turn, which was uh, difficult to master. As you can see, there was a lot of pollution, and the pollution can also be seen on the camera screen itself. A very good apart from its surface, with an interesting profile. Uh, there would need to be an enormous amount of investment to be made to bring it back up to standard. I competed there in 1989 at the wheel of a Jaguar, and it was just as difficult as it was at this time on camera. premier virage à droite avec cet empilage de monoplace, la piste très glissante et donc un enchaînement de de virages droite gauche. Very very slippy track, difficult to master. On voit qu'il y a beaucoup de pollution aussi à cette époque là so much pollution of course you don't touch your visor otherwise it would just smear so you just have to let those little black spots keep on growing until you got to the pits and maybe change the visor on your helmet particules de pneumatique et de d'huile dans les dans le tour d'installation it was basically just debris and oil thrown up off the track by the car in front son revêtement avec un un profil intéressant il y a énormément d'investissements, il y aurait énormément d'investissements d'investissements à faire. It's an extremely le, interesting en, track to drive. And it's a shame that it's been left to degrade as it has. Euh, avec une au volant d'une Jaguar. Oui. Et c'était aussi euh, difficile. Aussi difficile oui. qu'à l'époque. Et ce circuit effectivement lui aussi ne fait pas. It's no longer part of the World Championship calendar either. In the first of these documentaries there was a sequence that really struck our viewers. It was Montreal in with Patrick de Payet. Remember, the track seemed to have been polished. Well, we're going to return to Montreal, but this time in normal weather conditions. I will join René Arnaud, get back into the Canadian spirit. Well, with René Arnaud, we're already going a good speed. Right, left, first of all, modified since then. A long right, modified following the accident in 1986. As the right left that I remember with the pits now on the inside of the left hand side of the track. Well, this portion hasn't changed. Then comes the little corner to the right, which always creates the same problems of speed and grip with some hard braking for this right left chicane. Where Jean Pierre Jabouet was to have a very serious accident just after this. And then this right where Olivier Panis also had a very nasty exit from the track. Well, of course, hasn't changed for this chicane. It's the one that governs the return towards the tunnel. The portion hasn't changed at all. The surface is just as delicate. The winter is hard at uh, Montreal, and here under the tunnel, there's always this little bump. The safety measures have been modified when it comes to the sand pits and the piles of tyres at the track extremity. And that used to be the entry to the pits, and we used to be accelerating hard in the front of the pits before these very difficult right-left 
with one just before coming into the fastest stretch. Actually, I think it's uh, rather a pity to uh, lost these corners, even if they were very, very difficult and very dangerous to go through and even track officials to control. It was a hard track to race, that's for sure. Well, it's true that the track was very narrow. You take it really fast. Uh, truly, the typical impression of a dangerous circuit, a circuit that is delicate, difficult, and uh, is not really giving too much grip. Any grip problems there were in the early days. The whistling that you can hear, that's the carbon brakes working when they're not at their ideal temperature. And when they've not properly run in, these rapid stretches really are no doing well. As well know, Montreal is the most demanding circuit for brakes, well, a great circuit for brakes and for fuel consumption strategy, essentially because of a small problem gearbox control or gearbox ratios, this technical element is always a weakness in the use of a turbo engine, for example. Modern technology with sequential gearboxes with a turbo engine, that would have been ideal, that combination. Mm. We're still on the American continent at Dallas now, a town with a Grand Prix that's marked mines mainly due to the heat, the surface, all that happened there as well. Here with you again. <laughs> well, you seem to be enjoying it, but I'm not. Uh, here we have a circuit that was a real test at the formats of the American circuits. Blocks of concrete, protective fencing, a very narrow circuit. This was the time when Bernie Eccleston and the FOCA, Fokker, were trying to find a home ground for a Formula One Grand Prix in North America. There was Dallas, there was Phoenix, Las Vegas and Detroit. This particular Grand Prix has its own history because it was very hot in Dallas and the surface didn't stand up to the longer races on that day. Second day it began to break up a bit like it did in Belgium at Spa a few years later and we had enormous difficulty in keeping our cars on the track. It was a real nightmare. Note the narrowness and how difficult it is to control the car equipped with a turbo engine. I think it was uh, Keke Rosberg who won this race with an atmospheric engine. Yes, yeah, a real nightmare to drive here. Yes, I didn't take many pleasant souvenirs away from this particular circuit. So one for the atmospheric engines. <laughs> you know it all, my dear Patrick. To conclude the first half, let's join Patrick de Payet at the wheel. And uh, it has to be said that uh, Patrick de Payet with an onboard camera is quite something. We're going to join him on a very prestigious circuit with a pretty surprising view on the car that has remained in more than one memory, the six-wheel Tyrrell. It is, of course, Monaco with a car that was hugely intriguing and which gave its drivers the pleasure of driving something pretty exceptional. The technology wasn't avant-garde and it was designed by the Tyrrell stable that didn't hesitate in their choices with Elf. Look at the little wheels in the front which obliged Goodyear to work on a very unusual casting. Note to the enormously wide turning angle at the hairpin 
and then at the Porsche. Watch the work of Patrick's feet under the tunnel when it comes. Angle de braquage à l'épingle de Loïs, ensuite au portier. On peut aussi observer le, le travail des, des pieds de, de, de Patrick euh, de Paillet, ici sous le, sous le tunnel. Une technique de pilotage a probablement bien, bien différente. Ils avaient. Yes, euh, technically, very euh, different from the other cars. Il y aurait moins de surface, résistance, de pénétration mm. dans l'air. Il y aurait peut-être une, une empreinte. Le Tyrol n'a pas de bodywork pour les besoins de la caméra. C'est évidemment très euh, spectaculaire. Changing down by hands. This is a pretty precise example of the work the drivers had to do before the introduction of electronic sequential gearboxes back to the starting points. And it really is a fabulous sequence, it has to be said. Le retour au point de départ. Mais là, vraiment une séquence fabuleuse, il faut bien le dire. Patrick, on marque. A great sequence. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be straight back. Well, we're still with Patrick Tambay in a magnificent studio belonging to our friends at the AFAVA, where we will continue watching these magnificent sequences from our on cameras. Patrick, we're going to see a sequence from 1978 with you after the debuts. I wanted to ask you a question about your debut, your starting point. Uh, you started in Formula 1 with the Ensign team. What are your feelings at the time? Well, before we get to that, let me just say this is a marvelous studio. It's like Alibaba's cave. But to come back to your interesting question, the career that uh, a driver both then and now attempts to succeed in, it's hard to uh, even be given the possibility of being an official Formula One driver. It's a mix of different elements when you start, of uh, lucky circumstances. It's very hard. And in retrospect, I realize that I was extremely fortunate to come in at a moment when Elf was setting up in the filière. We had great uh, support from them with the arrival of Renault and all the good relations between the two companies, ELF and of course the Formula One world. Yes, a whole series of factors need to come together to actually give you the chance of becoming a driver at the highest level. It's not just about skill. Everything has to be in place. Un très important de, de leur part avec l'arrivée de Renault et puis euh, tout un, un relationnel que Elf. Well, the way that everything came together, our whole generation benefited, and it is much more difficult today because there are a lot of problems. At that time, there was a lot of personal hard work to be done, a lot of using your relationships, your connections, if you like. I think, if anything, that's even more the case these days. Well, I met the director of Tiro Racing and Ensign right at the start of the year, and it was necessary to do some financial dealing with him even then. The sums were not the same as they are now, and he followed this initiative by putting a second car at Ensign at my disposal, and it went well right from the start. And the year after, you went to McLaren, and that is the sequence we're going to see here. At the time, it was perhaps not the right choice. I had two options then at the end of 1977. First of all, to join Ferrari. Mauro Foggieri, I can witness to that because he was the originator of the negotiations and discussions. And then I signed with McLaren and I met Eddie Mayer and Philip Morris in London and they offered me a contract and I was a bit surprised. The first meeting with Enzo Ferrari had been cancelled and I had said to myself that uh, I wasn't going to hang on, I was going to take chance that came my way. They made it understood that I would be teammate to James Hunt, former world champion, and with the McLaren team in full expansion, that was going to work really well. Meanwhile, at Ferrari, Carlos Reutemann, the relations 
Mertens would have been more difficult than with James Hunt. As well as that, Ferrari was going into Michelin tyres and were probably going to have a difficult season. So I made a choice uh, that I regretted later, not in 1978, but more particularly in 79, since the McLaren wasn't a good car. Whilst that year, Ferrari, with their Michelin tyres, had an extraordinary season with Schechter and Villeneuve. In 1982, I was given a second chance. Any case, we followed you at the wheel of this McLaren 78, and it was on the circuit of Zandvoort. Next sequence, back with Philippe Streif. And we're in uh, Hungary, and we didn't see this circuit in the first edition. The Hungaro Ring, welcoming the Formula One in 1986. It's a circuit that is still in use today, but which has taken a lot of criticism. Well, it's a circuit from the modern era. Jerez was designed and the Hungaro ring was designed to almost the same specifications. That is to say that it had to be four kilometers maximum. There had to be numerous corners. It had to be somewhere that lent itself to spectators and where the spectators could see the cars as closely as possible. Speed shouldn't be too high so that no one was far in front front and it had to be no more than four kilometers so as to have a high number of laps for the spectator quality. That said, there were still a lot of problems, however, and here it was the first year in 1986, and Philip Streif at the wheel of the same car as in Mexico. And it was a complicated season. We were just coming to the end of the turbo engine era. In 86, I was at the wheel of a Lola Beatrix Ford with Adrian Newey as engineer and Ross Brown in the factory, a team set up by Teddy Mayer and Klaas. A very low speed circuit which was not favourable for a turbo engine with modern technology. The proof of the onboard cameras that we have today, we can feel the difference in rhythm even if this is only a warm-up lap and Philip Schreif is not yet at top speed. Le circuit est exactement le même qu'à qu l'époque, il n'a pas évolué. The circuit is exactly the same as it was at the time. It hasn't developed, except in the quality of the surface. This is the first day, and we can see a lot of dust and difficulty in finding some grip. At the start of the session, there is an oil spill from the car that had just gone past. First corner to the right, exactly the same as it is today. The left-right combination as well. After the first race, this stretch was later modified. As you can see, it was much too slow. We complained about the lack of speed and the lack of acceleration. The rhythm really was very slow. So this stretch of the circuit was redesigned. And this part, though, is part of the circuit that has remained as it is now. Same chicane now, same problem, same combination called the snake. Vision impaired by oil from Nigel Mansell, we see. At the time, we didn't yet have the uh, film and roll that cleaned the lens. Je me régale déjà pour la séquence suivante, Patrick, car on Now let's get back with de Paye. You've no doubt guessed that we have a small weakness for Patrick de Paye at the wheel of his onboard cameras, since we know that he goes really fast. And we're off to Brazil and Rio. And here we go, uh, quite something, a uh, very unusual circuit. It goes anti-clockwise, so it turns mainly to the left. It's the beginning of the year, so neck muscles are not yet fully developed. Uh, we didn't do as many winter drops. 
trials then, as they do these days. It really was an unbearable Grand Prix in physical terms, not far below 40 degrees as well, if not more, at sea level, with very high temperatures, very high humidity. The drivers and their teams, it really, really was a difficult race. Une température et surtout une humidité très très élevée et c'était vraiment pour les pilotes tout comme pour les acteurs tout le monde un grand prix très très difficile. Voici la longue ligne droite avec les. This is the long straight with the stands which were taken down after the parade of the Samba schools and installed at the circuit at Jacarapagua. And this left turn is very difficult for the neck muscles, especially those on the left were subjected to real torture. Everyone tried to hold onto their helmets in one way or another. Note the right-hand side of the cockpit in the Tyrol, a kind of rather summary tube installation. Everyone tried to refresh themselves as best they could. And in 1978, a victim of a blackout here used a kind of cooled bib to try and help matters. American NASCAR technology with cooled water and a system with a little windscreen wiper motor. Despite that, a certain moment, we both suffered blackouts. Very dangerous. Now for the next sequence, Patrick, uh, here too, a circuit that we didn't visit during our first edition. It's the Nürburgring. I wanted to ask you another question. Have you already completed, or competed, I should say, on the Nürburgring, since here it's obviously a new one? Well, I was lucky enough to do so in 1976, the race at the European Formula 2 Championship. That was won by Jacques Lafitte. I was second, and it was on the big back. Here we are, one of the classic circuits at the Nürburgring that we know today, with the hairpin in the distance, the hairpin in the big stadium. There were rather less stands then, and the entertainment structures at the time weren't quite as big as they are now. Now they're much higher, far more numerous, but the track is the same. That year was the inauguration with this very fast right-hand combination, which is uh, just as difficult to master today, but it's where you can gain time, and I think it's... Uh, Awful return chicane may no longer be the same, if I remember rightly. Well, here's a McLaren, and there's still some wet patches. Much more open uh, than it is today, and you have to slow down more. Long rights, bringing you back onto the straights by the pits, which still entails the same problems, understeering in particular. There's the same balance problem as well going to the right hand corner. Next sequence is of Alain Prost at Dijon. This is nice because it was here that he claimed his first victory, but it also. I'd like to ask you a question about the relationship between the drivers. Alain Prost, as we all know, is the most prestigious of drivers with the most important list of wins of any driver in the world. Were you ever jealous of him? Est-ce que vous avez pu être amoureux jaloux, par exemple, d'Alain Prost? Oui. Yes, I was jealous of him, and of others as well. To be in the right place at the right time, where circumstances allowed him to be behind the wheel of the McLaren in 1984, when we should have been teammates, the circumstances were unusual, jealous, even a little envious. But we all make our choices, and some make better ones than others at different points in their careers. More widely, you were friends with other drivers all the same. Sure, we all got on well. 
As with any human beings, there are those with whom you get on better than others. With Alan Prost, I always had a good relationship. With Gilles Villeneuve, I was particularly friendly, however. And it went further than just good relations. Now with age, since we have all aged, we get together with memories to share and uh, we have a much stronger relationship. We belong to the same club and we survived that period which is more than can be said for everybody and that means our relationships are different now to those we had at the time. So, as we said, Alain Prost is on the circuit in Dijon for the first of his 51 victories. What was the circuit of Dijon like? Well, you can always see that on Alain Prost's Renault, that the front wing is moving a lot. So there's a problem with its installation. Here we are in the combination of correct corners that everyone remembers. Historic fight between René Arnaud and Gilles Villeneuve. They're generally very fast races because Zijon is a high speed circuit uh, where the Renault turbo engine with Jean Pierre Jabouillet won its first victory. And this is one of the slowest corners on the circuit with a compression to the right going uphill, where it's important to find good drive. Another corner to the left, uh, we come into a very delicate combination of corners, a really difficult section. All the drivers who compete at Dijon will say it. These are corners taken at high speeds and on a slope, not flat out, but uh, biased and always difficult to get the right balance, especially in this right with a bump. A compression afterwards and all the conditions, the top speed on the straight as well combined. Yes, Alan Prost went into the pits here. Technically very tough. A very short circuit too, surprising uh, now because a lap only takes about a minute. Well, now we're off across the Atlantic to Watkins Glen and uh, Didier Peroni at the wheel of a Tyrrell. Tyrrell, who at Watkins Glen had one of the saddest episodes in their history with Francois Sever's accident when he was the leader of a young generation of drivers and also the protege of uh, Ken Tyrrell, Jackie Stewart and Francois Guiter. It was uh, following the death of that elf youngster that the uh, filier policy was set up. And we can see how dangerous this circuit is too with its rail. The great lesson that uh, Ken Tyrrell taught his drivers was that the most important thing was to finish, that above all they should drive their cars as if they were going between pieces of glass. And you realize here that with a two meter border of grass on either side and a rail that was badly fixed to the ground, uh, the problems of security were underlined and the enormous defect on what was otherwise a very pleasant circuit. I competed here much later at the wheel of a Bugatti in Guido Pastor's Monaco racing team and the circuit had not evolved at all. Et donc des problèmes de, de sécurité qui euh, se sont euh, trouvés euh, soulignés. No uh, runoff space à, whatsoever before you hit Là, the barriers. Plaisant, really ça, was very temps, dangerous. Du, du uh, J'ai couru uh, beaucoup plus tard, uh, il n'y a pas très longtemps, uh, en, au volant d'une Bugatti uh, de, du Monaco Racing Team de, de, Gildo, uh, de Gildo Pastor. Mm -hmm. Et le circuit n'avait absolument pas... Well, it's always a round of NASCAR at Watkins Glen, one of only two road circuits used in the NASCAR championship, which usually takes place on ovals. And we continue with you, Patrick, on the other side of the world this time. And Adelaide in Australia, with the round of the world championships, which is always considered to be a very pleasant meeting with a great atmosphere. Pour une, une manche du championnat du monde qui a toujours été considérée, enfin moi c'est toujours ce, ce dont j'en ai entendu parler, comme un rendez-vous très plaisant avec une ambiance formidable, euh, c'était la fête un petit peu. Yes, effectively, the Australians have fallen in love with Formula One, with a terrific ambassador at the time in the person of Alan Jones. Adelaide got geared up for a party to welcome the Formula One, just as Melbourne does these days.
accueillir la, la Formule 1, comme le fait au, aujourd'hui euh, Melbourne, en grand, euh, une grande rivalité entre cette partie de, l'o, de l'Australie et, et, et l'autre. Donc un circuit euh, toute pièce euh, fabriqué, un petit peu comme euh, aux États-Unis. Uh, we should explain to those who might not know that we are making a sign that means the driver can overtake you. I noticed a driver who was catching me up and I was uh, only warming up, running my tyres in. I was being careful. And what's more, at the time, uh, we had onboard cameras but no television. And there was a sophisticated system installed on the roll bar and during the first laps on the track we took precautions mainly for the drivers coming from behind. It was still mounted in a very reassuring way, but the uh, rhythm was not the same as uh, we see with onboard cameras now. Uh, the wide borders too here is the entry to the pits and the right with its very tight hairpin. We continue with a second lap with you on a circuit that is generally considered as being very successful for an urban circuit. Yes, uh, relatively varied, a uh, natural track on a race course, a long straight with a few right angles, which are characteristic of this kind of modern urban circuit. As in the United States, it's the lay of the land that uh, makes it what it is. Moderne comme aux États-Unis, c'est un petit peu le, la topographie du, du terrain qui, qui, qui veut ça. Now, unless I'm mistaken, we've just taken the corner where Damon Hill and Michael Schumacher collided in 1994. Absolutely. And after this right, we're going into a long straight. And it was here that Mika Hakkinen went up onto the border and was thrown onto the left hand side, onto the yellow tire wall, and went into a deep coma. And here along straight, uh, we go to the right rather than uh, sticking on to the left for the trajectory because uh, there's a lot of bumps. Uh, one of the problems, uh, along with the drainage systems as well, we all remember some serious southern showers and terrible flooding. And uh, here I get the steering and the braking all wrong, but it's the end of the lap, thank goodness. Voilà, ici je rate carrément mon point de corde et, et mon freinage. Et c'est la fin de ce tour. Mmh. I wanted to ask you a question about Ayrton Senna. We can't get away from it. We have to admit he was the fastest driver ever in the history of Formula 1, in any case, uh, with the same car. He always went faster than any other driver. Do you think that uh, this is true, and what is the explanation for that phenomenon? Well, there are a whole lot of reasons. Firstly, his professionalism, his talent, and I would even say his way of looking at a race. He imposed on his teammates, I think, on all his teammates, the need to work much more seriously than they ever had before. A very methodical person, very hard-working, requiring long debriefing sessions. He was always looking for progress, rather like Michael Schumacher. When he had his approach to racing, which at the time meant he performed better than uh, any other drivers. It was as simple as that. I believe that uh, contact with him meant that Alan Prost also worked worked even more professionally. He discovered a lot of things through contact with him. As an exterior observer, I think that he pushed his team ceaselessly, and he pushed his engineers and his technicians ceaselessly as well, much as Michael Schumacher does today, apparently, as all drivers today need to do. But do you have the feeling, given the uh, innate talent, that it was difficult to be jealous of him in the end, to return to what we were saying earlier, that even other drivers were in sheer awe of him? Is that true? Well, yes, 
Exactly. Right from the start, it was noticeable that Tertan Senna had something unusual, rather special, in his relationships and in his behaviour as well. I've had a few personal anecdotes about uh, that, and his arrival was accepted more or less as remarkable, rather like Schumacher's. When a young driver arrives and starts to drive, you know if they're going to be amongst the very best. And with him, this was the case. Right from the start, people like him are noticed. Some accepted it, others rather less so, conscious of a rival in their midst. Etten Senna was quite exceptional. Mm. Yes, in the shadow of such a man, it can be very, very difficult. He really was a very different kettle of fish altogether. While we're on the subject, let's join Ayrton Senna at the wheel of this magnificent all black lotus in the streets of Monaco for two and a half laps. Let's make the most of it. Well, we're in the first warm-up lap. The track officials salute the drivers with their flags. They really enjoyed building friendly relationships. And Senna also worked on these relationships because at Monaco, it is very important to be able to count on the competence of the track officials. Your life often is quite literally in their hands. S'appuyer sur les compétences de l'ensemble des commissaires de piste qu'il faut, qu faut saluer aussi. Et puis ce virage à droite du portier où Ayrton Senna va perdre une course un petit peu plus tard. Well, here is a de, de right hand portier corner where Senna fautes, fautes, lost a race a bit later. Monaco, mm -hmm. He was the king of Monaco, but he did make a few mistakes. His list of wins is exceptional, but he could have taken it even further without uh, the mistakes at Portier. A mistake caused by a lack of concentration. And it's so narrow, and these cars were much wider than those today. A lot of precautions were necessary. With much wider back tyres, it's uh, still the same problem, of course, these days. The port chicane now, then the uh, piscine combination, and here the uh, Raskas hairpin with Anthony Noge. I'm going to keep quiet now and enjoy it. Tires are warm, he's off. Well, note the great difficulty of using a turbo engine at Monaco. There were no rules limiting power, and there were 
7,400 horsepower with a Renault engine in qualification. And they completely removed the valves and added a cap in the place. And the power was amazing with qualification tyres. Note the acceleration blast that Ayrton Senna gives to get the turbo into action and to get the power plateau and acceleration, the boost and pressure. And uh, here is behind uh, a Brabham, and you can see the difficulty of driving in these conditions. Just look at him go, very tight on the bump, the right hand uh, frequently changing gear while trying to keep the wheel in the right place, very tough. What is amazing is the difference in rhythm compared to the onboard cameras now with uh, 18,000 revs, sequential gearbox and almost automatic gear changes. The drivers are mainly concentrated on their braking efficiency, their entry speed on curves and anticipating acceleration. There really is a big difference in that. Sur l'anticipation de l'accélération, même si aujourd'hui ils sont dans ce domaine aussi euh, un petit peu euh, maîtrisés ou contrôlés par euh, les systèmes techniques d'antipatinage. On voit vraiment de grosses différences. Oui. Bon, ben c'est terminant. Bon, that's all for this second edition of this very special kind of program. And we had no hesitation in producing it with Patrick once again. And I think we made the right decision because it really was extraordinary. And uh, your comments were, as usual, extremely welcome and interesting. Thanks for that. Patrick, thank you for coming. And we hope to see you again on Motors TV. As for you at home, thanks for being with us. It's bye-bye.